I am David Bruce. This is Jungle Queens, and today we have The White Gorilla. Perhaps a film that should never have been made. It stars Lorraine Miller, and bless her heart. Ah, oh, man, I tell you. Uh, she had won a contest in Flint, Michigan, where she was a, a girl. And um, that the winning that uh, contest, that rodeo contest, gave her an MGM contract and out to Hollywood she came. And you know, like any um, starlet, you, you want to do good and you want to make some good films and, and uh, sink your uh, teeth into a good career. Well, it didn't exactly happen. If you look for her um, filmography, it's rather hard, rather sparse. And her um, Time in Hollywood turned out to be more like a minute in Hollywood. Too bad. Now, The White Gorilla is an interesting film because, uh, well, it was shot in, I forget, was it three days and one night? And it took six weeks to complete it. it they took uh, footage from uh, a 1927 silent film and crammed it into this. So it was um, it was just kind of an attempt to uh, cash in on the Jungle Queen uh, craze, and and that they did. This thing was made for uh, just pennies on the dollars that they finally received for it. It made a ton of bucks when it was released into the theaters, I guess. People really wanted to see Jungle Queen movies. I'm not really sure. But anyways, uh, the, the other thing about this, as you're watching it, you'll notice, and I will point it out to you, you can tell the difference between the part that was shot in 1927 and then the part in 1945. And then to kind of tie it all together, there's a narrator. <laughs> it's like, ah! Anyway, this is the film about um, um, how producers like to cash in on successful genres. And so this is an example of it. And sometimes they can leave in their wake uh, something pretty devastating like Lorraine Miller, who really did deserve better than this and uh, really wanted a great career. My gosh, she had a contract with MGM. How could you do much better than that? Well, let's get to watching it. I'm David the Bruce. The jungle, weird, mysterious, home of countless beasts of prey with their thunderous roars and haunting cries, echoed by the somber beat of distant drums, drums that tell of natives hidden in its fastness, with its paths leading to unseen, unheard of dangers.
the jungle through which countless and daring explorers have fought their way, seeking to verify the truth of the strange and fantastic stories that have veiled this land of mystery, some of them never to return. Victims of the savage tribes who call the jungle theirs, some to fall before the flashing fangs of jungle beasts, others like myself to escape, carrying with me vivid scars and memories that can never be erased. Memories that recall a strange, unbelievable experience that started when I, Steve Collins, was acting as a guide out of Morgan's trading post. There you are, Stacy. There's what you ordered, huh? That ought to fix you up. It'll take more than that to fix me up. Don't tell me the jungle is getting you. Not the jungle. It's the everlasting noise that comes from it that gets on my nerves. I don't see how you stand it, Morgan. I've grown so used to jungle noise, I'd be lonesome without it now. You know I'll get used to it. Yeah? I might get used to it, Morgan, but I'll never feel lonesome for it. I'll agree with you on that point. Maybe you'll agree with me on another. That if Bradford was a fool to attempt an expedition through a country he knew so little about. Well, you won't get an argument there. Me either. I'll go you one further. I think you and I are fools to try to solve a riddle that's never been explained. We do know that Ed Bradford entered the jungle. But until we settle, once and for all, whether he is dead or alive, we're going to be guests of Mr. Morgan here at the trading post. Yes, and keep on being fools. For my part, I just as soon call it off. Of course I do. It's Steve Collins, Bradford's guide. Right. What do you suppose happened to Bradford and the rest of them? If he's the guide, what could have happened? No. Don't let him get me. Easy now. Easy. The marks on him sure have been pretty badly clawed, too. Think it was a lion? If a lion jumped him, he wouldn't be here. Oh. Easy now, fella. You want to sit up? You're all right now, Collins. This is Morgan. You're back in my trading post. The beast you sought? Well, no. We only heard you fall outside the door. Oh, it's no use. If you didn't see it, you wouldn't believe me. No one would. Believe what? That I saw the white gorilla. <laughs> you didn't see any pink elephants at the same time, did you? Or any singing rhino? <laughs> I've heard of a lot of queer beasts since I've been here, but no white gorillas. <laughs> well, I have. You have? Many times from the natives. They claim there is a white gorilla, an outcast from all other gorillas due to its odd coloring. It was driven out of its family's circle when it was born, and its hate for anything that walks makes it a deadly enemy, one to keep clear of. Was it the white gorilla that jumped you? Yes. Maybe that's what got Bradford. You were Bradford's guide. Is that what happened to him? No. Well, what did? You knew the country you were going into. Why didn't he return with you? Because he wouldn't listen to me. From the time we left here, he set the course, picked the trails. 
We went on for days, making camp at night, always near a stream. Even after a long day's trek, he would insist on exploring away from camp. I knew we were in bad country, country where the natives hated the white man. I warned Bradford time after time to stay close to camp. But he would just laugh. Start out with one of his party. Then when he failed to return, I started out looking for him. And when I found him, I saw why he hadn't returned. Bradford's trail led me to this village. The tone of their drums warned me to go easy. Hidden nearby, I discovered Bradford and Allison were prisoners of one of the most savage tribes in the jungle. As I watched, trying to figure a way to rescue them, an elephant entered the village. I could hardly believe my eyes when I saw a small white boy drop from the elephant's trunk. This mere slip of a child here in the jungle among the wild beasts and savage tribes, it was uncanny. who this little jungle boy was and what strange power he held over the natives was beyond me. Bradford and Allison lost no time in getting away. made up my mind to find out who the boy was. But when he left the village, he disappeared. <laughs> Losing track of Bradford and Allison, I climbed a tree hoping to locate them. Bradford met up with one of the native boys from our camp. He was trying to get his bearings from the tree. Suddenly, he became excited. Then I noticed why. The jungle boy clinging to his elephant's trunk had entered the clearing. reason when the little fellow saw them, he turned and ran back into the jungle. Then the jungle menace confronted Bradford. He 
trapped by the lions, and without firearms, he took the only means of escape. As I watched him, I forgot the jungle boy and the fact that I too was trapped by the wild beasts. I noticed something moving through the undergrowth along the river bank. As I watched, I wondered if the little jungle boy could possibly belong to her. The hippo had seen the girl on the raft. Then Bradford discovered the girl's danger. We watched the girl as the hippo swam after her. Unaware of her danger, she continued downstream. Look out! Look out! Spellbound, I watched the girl's frantic efforts to escape the onrushing brute. Then I saw Bradford snap into action. As he climbed out on the tree limb, I held my breath wondering if it would hold its weight or crash with him into the stream. witnessing the narrow escape of the girl, I believe in miracles and believing in them convinces me there is something to the fantastic tales concerning the jungle mysteries. Uh, who was the girl? Where did she come from?
There it is. Nothing there now, Colin. It was. I saw it through the window. It followed me here. There's nothing outside, Steve. I tell you, Morgan, I saw it. All right, take it easy. Sure, sure you did. Collins. Uh, uh, you were about to tell us about the girl you saw on the raft. What became of her in Bradford? Yeah, yeah. She was a daughter of an explorer. Her father had contracted jungle fever and lost his eyesight, he was stone blind. They lived in a shack near a stream. Ah, they were a pair of fools, just like Bradford. Go ahead, Steve. Now then we moved over to their camp. We were there for months. All but mind you, that wasn't my idea. Bradford insisted on it. One must have reasons for spending months in this forsaken country. Oh, they had reasons, all right. And a good one. Had a map. And Lou Hanley, the best guide in the country. He told me they were nearing the end of their search. Man alive, what were they after? Where were they going? To the cave of the Cyclops. Never heard of that before, have you, Morgan? Why, yes. It's been a legend around here for years. It's supposed to be a cave filled with untold treasures and guarded by the Cyclops. You all know what a Cyclops is supposed to be. Oh, uh, why, yes, uh, sort of an idol with one eye. That's right, an idol. And the rest of the legend is that anyone who enters the cave never leaves it alive. Hanley, the old man's guide, was to share in the Cyclops treasure. That is, if they found it. But after Bradford rescued the girl, he figured that the old man, to show his appreciation, might give him the map. So Hanley decided to get it before that could happen. But Bradford, being suspicious of Hanley, was on the lookout. I had been out scouting for Allison, who had gone to our camp for some ammunition. Returning to the old man's shack, I decided to have a look before barging in. It was lucky I did. Between me and the shack, there was nothing I could do but sit tight.
watched the maddened beast charge at the door, I was tempted to fire my few remaining shells into their hides at the risk of turning them in my direction, where I would be at their mercy. Then it happened. The door gave way and the lions crashed in. dive through the window and escape into the jungle. Then it was over. Bradford had driven the beasts off. The excitement was too much for the old man, and he died soon afterwards. Hanley, the guide, disappeared. Bradford took the girl and started back for his own camp. And they left you? No. I followed them some distance behind with Carter, one of the men from the old man's camp, on the lookout for Hanley. No one trusted him, and we didn't want to take any chances. What has all this to do with the white gorilla? Well, I was coming to that. It was while we were moving through the jungle. I was well to the rear, and Carter was some distance behind me. Bradford and the girl headed straight for our camp. As I followed after them, I wondered what had become of the strange little jungle boy. It didn't seem possible that this child with his supernatural powers over the natives and the beasts of the jungle could be a reality. As I picked my way along the trail, I could hear the sound of the waterfall in the ravine off to my left, where the beasts of the jungle went to quench their thirst, little knowing that at that very moment the jungle boy The chattering of the monkeys in the trees should have warned me of my own danger. Unaware of the white gorilla's presence, I continued along the trail. his victim, Carter. Help! I 
tried to figure out how to get Carter from the beast. I brought my gun to bear. Fired a couple of shots, hoping the sound would make it run. I tried to use the rifle as a club, but the beast with its big hand struck me down. Then it turned its attentions to Carter and dragged him off into the jungle. I was stunned and hurt. I tried to trail the beast, hoping I could get close enough to land a lucky shot that would not endanger Carter. of the white gorilla startled the elephant herd and stampeded them. <coughs> Hanley, who had been following Bradford's trail, crossed the aroused brute's path. Tiny beady eyes of the lumbering beast centered on the fleeing figure of Hamlet. Believing him to be the cause of the disturbance, they took after him. By a twist of fate, he took refuge in the same hut where Bradford and the girl were waiting for Carter and myself. As I watched the maddened herd destroy the hut, I discovered the jungle boy and his elephant approaching. boy's mystic powers. He had stopped the beasts from their deadly destruction by the call of his elephant. Fascinated by what I saw, I found myself glued to the spot. Again that strange little boy and his elephant came to the rescue of Bradford. <coughs> Seeing they were safe, my only thought was to get Carter and do something to help him.
Little did I know as I followed the trail of the white gorilla through the jungle, the nature of the huge monster that was to cross our path. As the outcast and the black gorilla met, the jungle vibrated with their wild battle cry. Carter where the white gorilla had dropped him. While the mad beasts fought to destroy each other, I carried Carter to safety. What became of Bradford and the girl? You said they were safe. Well, they... Uh... I've never seen such solemn faces. What's happened? Oh, uh, this is Mr. Collins, dear. Bradford's guide. He was attacked by a white gorilla. A white gorilla? Yes. Oh, Mr. Collins. My daughter, Ruth. I'm very glad to meet you, but I can't say that I'm glad to see you here in the jungle. You know, this is no place for a lady. Oh, she's perfectly safe here. Go ahead and tell us what happened to Bradford and the girl. Yes, uh, sit down, Ruth. It's all right, go ahead. Well, I brought Carter to a friendly native village where I learned that the jungle boy, with the aid of a friendly roving band of Arabs, had taken Bradford and the girl. Hanley had followed them. He planned to get rid of Bradford before making another attempt to find the cave of the Cyclops. Hanley had a friend among the natives. He enlisted him on his side against the whites. A trail of blood from a freshly killed small boar was to be the bait for a trap from which there could be no escape. Thank <laughs> you. 
As the hungry lions continued their attack, I thanked my lucky stars for the decision I made, never to be caught too close to Bradford as long as Hanley roamed the jungle. The one thing Hanley overlooked when he conceived his plan to kill Bradford and the girl was the little jungle boy. Bradford, the girl and the boy were among the few to escape the beast's attack. I found Hanley's body just outside the village, a victim of his own plot. How terrible. Yes, but how lucky they had the jungle boy on their side. Strange. A boy like that wandering around loose? I heard of him before. To the natives, he's taboo. That's right. I found out later why when I trailed the girl in Bradford to his camp. I discovered that the cave of the Cyclops was only a few miles from our camp. The woman was the mother of the little jungle boy. Her years in the jungle had taught her that the natives believed the insane harmless and possessed untold powers. One of feeble mind was safe from all harm. To the natives, taboo. To protect herself and the boy, she pretended to be just that, insane. Known as Tiger Men, the natives who inhabited the Cyclops cave worshipped the idols there. Discovering this, the woman secretly hollowed out one of them and taught the boy to lower and raise the idol's arms at her command. This display of her supposedly supernatural powers gave the woman control over the natives, so far as her own and the boy's safety was concerned. When the tiger men informed her that white people were in camp close by, she ordered them brought to the cave, secretly hoping through them to effect the escape of herself and the boy from the jungle. The beasts of the jungle seemed to sense that something unusual was about to happen. Tiger men surrounded Bradford's camp and proceeded to carry out the woman's orders. returned with their prisoners, the woman realized that something was wrong. She had ordered them brought in to her, but not this way.
And Tiger men had plans of their own. Plans to sacrifice the whites to starve, imprison, madden killers. I had been scouting near the cave, and from where I was hidden near the entrance, I could see the frantic efforts of the woman as she tried to stop the sacrifice. The little jungle boy entering the cave saw what was about to take place. As fast as his little legs could carry him, he ran to his place in the idol. He worked the arms and forced the image to breathe in an effort to save the whites. I knew I could do nothing. I managed to get away without being seen, praying and hoping to find help that they would still be alive. As I made my way through the jungle, I became aware that I was being followed by an animal of some kind. It was the white gorilla, the outcast, a scourge of the jungle. He seemed to know my gun had jammed. I backed away. He came at me, closer and closer. I thought it was the end. He mauled me with his brute strength and ponderous weight. Suddenly, something caused him to stop. It was the black monster, his eyes burning with hate for the white outcast. Again, the jungle vibrated as the two beasts met.
every bone in my body aching, I limped away. Staggered through the jungle, I hoped against hope that the brutes would kill each other as they fought. I kept on going, and then... That's it. Oh. Well, you all know the rest. No wonder you're still alive. You know, it, it still may not be too late to help those people in the cave. Do you think it possible, Collins? Well, there is a chance if we start now, we should be able to make it by daylight. You're not going. Ruth, stay here and look after him. And remember, under no condition, leave the post. I won't, Dad, but how, well, how are you going to find the place? Uh, Steve, what's the shortest route to the cave? Well, when you leave the post, you go due north to the river. And you follow the old elephant trail to the left. Well, just keep on going. You won't miss it. But, but what? Look out for the white gorilla. Remember, don't leave the post. I understand, Dad. <coughs> well, I think you'd better sit down here and let me see if I can't clean up these scratches. Your shoulder certainly looks a lot better this morning, Mr. Collins. Well, thanks to you, I feel a little better, all except my leg. We'll take care of that right now. Let's see it. Missy! 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 <laughs> Missy! What a little girl get lost in jungle. She no come back. You stay here, Mr. Collins. You're in no condition to leave. I'll go. But your father told you not to leave the post. I won't go far. I'll just go to the edge of the post grounds. But, Miss Stacy. You stay here, my ma. Fix bandage on leg. Understand? Me understand. All right. All right, mama. Me see like you fix it. Somehow I knew I was wrong when I allowed the girl to leave the post. The restlessness that prevailed through the jungle should have been a warning to her that danger was near.
The outcast seemed to sense that there was something different about this victim. of the unconscious girl puzzled him. When I found her rifle, I knew something had happened. As the beast heard me, he turned and faced me with all his pent-up anger. I knew this time it was my life or his. she was unharmed, I couldn't understand. Hi. I don't know how to thank you, Mr. Collins. Well, it's the other way around. I'm grateful to you. I killed the white gorilla. Oh, but what happened to the child that, that I didn't find? Well, we had barely left the compound when it wandered back. Oh, that's good. Oh, but don't tell father. Don't tell him what? Well, you'll find out anyway from the natives, so I might just as well tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me what? Well, you see, uh, a native child got lost, and I went looking for it, and well, I, I... She ran into an old enemy of mine, the white gorilla. I killed it. The white gorilla? Uh, did you find the cave of the Cyclops? Uh, were you able to help uh, some of the people? We found the cave all right, but uh, in the tiger's pit there were nothing but bones. Tigers were the only living things there. And winds up our trip. Our search is through. That's right. We'll leave as soon as we can. And we'll be soon be going home, dear. Well, Steve, that leaves just the two of us. Uh -uh. Just you. I'm going with you. You? For all these years, you're going to leave the jungle? Yeah. After all, we have no right to the jungle. It belongs to the natives. The birds, the animals, and have been here since time began. In a way, they have a right to protest our intrusion. It was theirs before we came. It should be theirs now. You know, I feel kind of sorry I had to kill that white gorilla. He's 
seemed almost human. Pathetic. Standing there, wondering what had happened to him. His death seemed to cast a spell of loneliness over the jungle. The wild cries and mad roars of the beast suddenly quieted. A silent tribute to his passing. And the black gorilla the monster with his huge chest filled with hate. I can almost see him as he discovers the white outcast lying there as though sleeping. His efforts to make him do battle. And then the change. His bewilderment as he looks at the motionless figure. The sort of human emotion that comes over him. Then the slow realization. The outcast is dead. Then the animal instinct returns. The instinct to cover up and hide the remains of a fallen one from the scavengers of the jungle. A gesture for forgiveness as he chants the death call for the outcast of his race, the white gorilla. Lorraine Miller was attending nursing school at Michigan State College in hopes of being a doctor one day. That all changed when she entered a beauty contest and won Perfect Body Girl by the United Auto Workers. The prize was a trip to Hollywood. She received a two-way ticket for her visit to Hollywood. When they're visiting the studios, she was smitten. She cashed in her return ticket, got a room at the Hollywood Girls Club, where other young hopefuls roomed. Interestingly, her roommate was the soon-to-be-famous Donna Reed. It became a lifetime friendship. Every day she pounded the payment looking for jobs, visiting casting agents and studios. But, no real success. Even though she did get some minor roles, she had to take other jobs to make ends meet. Lorraine finally turned to nursing. Interestingly, studios needed nurses on set, and she was so assigned. She was noticed by a producer and cast in a bit part in the 1941 movie, Ball of Fire. And that led to a more significant career for the actress. In addition, the film led to a huge PR event. The Los Angeles Fire Department made her their Ball of Fire Girl to symbolize Fire Prevention Week. The Fire Department put on a big parade, and she was the main event. Side note, during the war years, more houses in America caught fire than were bombed by the Nazis in England. Her hometown of Flint, Michigan, was so excited about her movie roles that they proclaimed October 21, 1941, as the official Lorraine Miller Day. She came as the guest of the hometown mayor for a homecoming parade and festivities. 
After all, she was the first citizen of Flint to appear in a Hollywood movie. Returning to Hollywood her career seemed to be in an upswing. In the 1943 film, Hi Diddle Diddle, she played seven different characters. She had potential. But somehow it was not fully realized. Of her total 35 films, she was uncredited in 14 of them. She had starring roles mostly in her low-budget films, which were primarily westerns. The most significant part of her 20-year career lasted for only four years, from 1941 through 1945. In 1945 she was cast in 10 films. But then the following year, only two. Over the next 11 years, just six. Those 10 films in 1955 were primarily low-budget, low-quality films, including The White Gorilla. The only major film for her that year was an uncredited bit part in Ziegfeld Follies as a dancer. The writing was on the wall. Her last two appearances were in 1960 and 61 on TV shows. One of those was on the popular Donna Reed TV show. Interestingly, her showbiz career began with Donna Reed as her roommate in 1941, and ended in 1960 on the Donna Reed show. Great friends to the end. Sadly, the Rain Miller's career in Hollywood is typical. Most never fully make it. As they say, don't quit your day job. You know, I've seen that girl somewhere before.